In this video, we're going to discuss the de Broglie equation. Now, in the previous few videos, we've looked at some failures of classical mechanics, specifically the UV catastrophe and the photoelectric effect. And these were both situations where electromagnetic radiation was, it was required to consider the electromagnetic radiation as some sort of particle, right? In the case of the photoelectric effect, we needed to consider electromagnetic radiation as a stream of particles called photons in order to match up our model with what was observed experimentally. And so we've been dancing around this idea of wave particle duality, right? And this is the idea that um, all matter exhibits wave-like and particle-like properties, right? So we've looked at two cases where in order to explain some phenomena of electromagnetic radiation, we had to consider particle-like behavior. D the de Broglie equation looks at the opposite of this duality, right? The fact that um, particles exhibit some wave-like behavior. So really the starting point for the de Broglie equation is to consider the uh, energy of the photon or a mass of a photon that was derived in the last video, right? So we saw that a, a photon will have a mass that's equal to Planck's constant over its wavelength times the speed of light, right? And so this basically tells you, you know, every every photon is going to have a mass that's proportional to the inverse of its of its wavelength or proportional to its frequency. Now, de Broglie took this idea one step further because he said, OK, if this applies to a very small particle that's traveling really, really fast, a photon, then for consistency's sake, this property should extend to any particle, any object, really traveling at some speed. So basically what he did here was say, okay, well, instead of the speed of light, let's change this to just the velocity that some particle is moving at, right? So I'll just call it the velocity V of some particle's motion. And if we rearrange this equation to solve for wavelength, right, then we end up with H over MV, this is the de Broglie wavelength equation. And basically what this is saying is that any particle with a mass m traveling at some velocity v has a wavelength, right? And this sort of flies in the face of traditional classical physics where light is treated as waves and, you know, particles that have a mass, they're treated as, you know, as objects with a mass that aren't delocalized, right? This is saying that any traveling object, something traveling at any speed, has a wavelength that we can calculate and quantify, right? Um, so this is really the other piece of that duality that every single particle can be treated like a wave with a given wavelength, lambda, right? So let's look at this as, as an, ex an example uh, question, and I think this will help bring home this point. So it says, compare the wavelength of an electron traveling at a speed of one times 10 to the seven with that of a ball with a mass of 0.1 kilograms traveling at 35 meters per second, right? So we're going to compare the wavelength of an electron that's traveling at a really high speed to just a standard ball that's traveling at some dis at some velocity of a you know normal throw, right? So let's look at what we would get for the electron, right? So for the electron, for the electron, we're going to calculate its wavelength. I'm gonna call it lambda sub e for the electron. And obviously we need to use the de Broglie wavelength equation, right? So um, Planck's constant over the mass times the volume. And from there, all we have to do is just plug in all the information that we know and solve from there, right? So we always have Planck's constant. That's going to be six times six point six two six times ten to the negative thirty four joules times seconds over the mass of an electron, which is given to us nine point one times ten to the negative thirty one, right? So nine point one one times ten to the negative thirty one kilograms times the velocity, they tell us that it's traveling at 1.0 uh, 1 times 10 to the negative, or 10 to the seven meters per second, times 10 to the seven meters per second. Okay, 
So let's see how our units shake out here, right? So um, in this case, seconds cancels out, right? Uh, kilograms is that, in fact, let me um, expand this unit for joules. So I'm gonna use the SI unit for joules so that we can look at the complete cancellation here. So let me put that guy back. So for, uh, for joules, the SI unit is kilograms meter squared per second squared, right? So joules times seconds would be kilograms meter squared per second, right? So now we can see the full cancellation here. So the seconds cancels out there, right? This meter in the denominator cancels out with one of the meters in the numerator. Kilograms cancels out. So we're just left with meters as our final unit using Planck's constant in joules times seconds. So the final answer that you get here for the wavelength of an electron is 7.27 times 10 to the negative 11 meters, right? So that's going to be the wavelength for an electron. Now, let's look at what we got for the ball. So if we're calculating for the ball, I'm going to use lambda sub b for the ball. Same equation though, h over mv. So now again, we use Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 kilograms meter squared per second. The mass of this ball is 0.1 kilograms, so we plug that in. So 0.1 kilograms and the speed that is traveling at is 35 meters per second right again all your units cancel out to leave you with meters so the wavelength of the ball is going to be 1.9 times 10 to the negative 34 meters okay so now you might be saying well these are both very very small numbers and you'd be right Right. Um, but it's very clear that the wavelength of this larger object, the ball traveling at, you know, 35 meters per second, its wavelength is much shorter than the wavelength of the electron. But even still, this value is rather small. So why do we care about this wave like property or the wavelength of an electron? Well, um, an average if we think about what an average CH bond is, so an average carbon hydrogen bond. It's just to give you a, a taste of, you know, how small we're talking about here when we talk about a bond. So a carbon hydrogen bond, its average length is about 1.09 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Right. So this is the average uh, CH bond length. So if we're looking at this scale, right, if we're looking at electrons being important on this scale, this wavelength is actually really important to us. It's only one order of magnitude below the average CH bond. So it's going to have some effect on molecular and atomic structure that the wavelength of this ball doesn't have on its physics, right? So for this ball, you know, its, it's diameter is, is orders of magnitude larger than this wavelength. So its wavelength is unimportant to its physics. But because this wavelength of the electron traveling at its speed is close to molecular bond lengths, it's, it's you know, longer than, you know, probably the length of, of a nuclei or something like that, right? It's, it's going to be very important on an atomic level in a way that the wavelength of this ball traveling at a speed is not important in a macro sense, right? In, in, in the macroscopic world, right? So that gives you a little bit of, you know, the other side of this wave particle duality and a little bit of justification why we need these wave properties and why they're important to consider for electrons.